Hi everybody, thank you for joining us and welcome to the FFB National Resilient or webinar on resilience, nature or nurture. Um, I'm Rachel Barham and I'm actually one of the membership advisors for the FFB covering South East London. Um, I'll shortly, shortly be handing over to our fabulous speaker today, who is Bayo Ego and founder of Bego Coaching. Bayo is, of course, an FSB member and he is actually an FSB volunteer lead for Inner London South as well. Um, I'd normally give you a lot more of an introduction to Bayo, but based on the webinar today, he's going to be talking a lot about himself. So I'm going to give him the privilege of telling you all more about him. Um, during the presentation, you are more than welcome to put your questions um, using the panellists button, or so the questions to panellists, um, and I'll try and get through them all at the end. Um, just in case you're not aware, this session will be recorded, so if you do have to shoot off at any point or you want to re-watch it, um, it will be available on the website to watch at a later stage as well, so you just go over to the on-demand page. Um, if you're not FSB members, then we'd love to have the opportunity to speak to you and tell you more about why people like Bayo and myself are members and all the amazing benefits that are available to you. So you can also find that on the FSB website and you can book a meeting with your local membership advisor as well, which I'd greatly recommend because they can actually then find out more about your business and talk to you about the relevant benefits. Um, but for now, rather than me doing all the talking, I am going to hand you over to the amazing Bayo, um, and he can tell you a little bit more about his story and his life. Over to you, Bayo. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, thank you all for joining us this morning on this webinar. Um, amazing. That's a good one. Watch this space. So we're going to talk about resilience, and the question suggests nature or nature, nature or nurture. Um, I'm not going to give a definition of resilience. We can all find out for ourselves. But what I want to do is share my story um, of growing up and how I became partly who I am, talk a bit about um, imposter syndrome to a degree, how I built my resilience, I think, where that's come from in terms of my lifestyle, my upbringing, and what I do now. I'll talk about the shapers um, of in my life. And what I want to do is bring that round to how we, as business owners, uh, deem being resilient as being important or how and what we need to do to be resilient or create resilient workforce or be able to work in places where resilience comes to the fore. So that's a few of the headings of the subject matters I'm going to be talking about. Hopefully I'll get through them all. Um, and as Rachel said, there'll be some opportunity for Q&As and I hope just a general discussion on how and what we think about resilience. So let's start with me growing up. Um, I'm born of African descendants. My parents are from Nigeria, West um, Africa, who immigrated into this country in the 60s. Um, I was a 60s kid, apparently born the day or, or the month that we landed on the moon or thereabouts, apparently. Um, and so growing up, as I did in South London, um, Brixton, it was interesting. It was difficult. Uh, my parents were here. My mother apparently couldn't speak a word of English. My man had no formal education and stuff, but they were very ambitious individuals, two very ambitious individuals who wanted to do well for themselves. And with that, with their offspring, uh, namely myself and my two sisters. But what was quite different between me and my siblings is that I became a home aloner. Um, remember the great film? It's one of the films that I watch quite often, a lot, because it struck me as probably not being as funny as it was um, when I was growing up. So let's start from the very beginning. Born and bred South London, Brixton, um, London Brother Lambeth, with my parents who gave me a very strict Nigerian upbringing. And at around 10, my parents decided that they wanted to return to Nigeria and set up businesses for themselves, which was great. Uh, we were going back and forth anyway, but I said to them both, not for me, I want to return to London. I don't really want to stay in Nigeria. I'm a Londoner, I want to go home. Um, and somehow they agreed. They agreed for a 10 year old to return to London uh, while they and my two sisters set up a new life in Nigeria. So I was fortunate enough to come back. We still had the family home and I lived in the home with what I thought were my parents' relations, namely cousins, uncles and aunts. Many years later, 
it transpired that they weren't. They were young people who were paying my mother and father rent. Nigerian, but they weren't related to us. So I grew up in my household, which, which is still the family home now. And before that, I have to share the story that, yeah, my mother and father, as I said, were strict Nigerians, very strict upbringing. I probably learned how to cook, bathe, look after myself, do everything before I was seven or eight. There was an expectation for us to be able to do everything and anything that had or helped the household. We were brought out to shopping um, across South London, various Afro-Caribbean markets, across Brixton, Peckham, and there I say it's some parts of North London, but essentially it wasn't just there to carry the bags. It was just there. It was there to be part and parcel of understanding what was culturally acceptable for us in terms of food, diet and behavior. And that was dr drummed in us very hard. Equally drummed into us was ed education. It was important for my, my, my parents that we were fully educated. But with education, it's not just the formal educated, but being well read being respectful and being understanding. So all of those things were drummed into me very early on. So when, when the decision was, okay, we can let you stay in the house on your own, but there was given rules and expectations that you'll be going to school, you'll be doing the good things. Now, it wasn't all plain sailing. Um, I was on my own most of the time. School has, was, and still is a very important part of my life as it is with my children, because that's where I started to build relationships. That's where I started to understand people who would protect me, understand me during my plight. It weren't the teachers for obvious reasons. It weren't the social mores or, or fabrics for obvious reasons. It was just friends who were in similar situations to me and family members. Dare I say in the seventies and eighties of that time, there were a number of home aloneers. Um, and we would meet in each other's homes. There was obviously older ones, I was 10, 11, 12 at that time. There were 13 years, 16 years, 18 year olds who would look after us, who might cook for us, who would watch out for us. Um, there I said, Brixton at the time, I lived through free riots. So it was, it was kind of a dodgy, difficult place, but you had to be fairly strong. You had to be fairly confident. You had to be fairly aware of what was going on and in and around you. So that sort of helped develop that hard edge and early ability to accept knockbacks, early ability to accept rejection. I'm gonna move on to what was a really important part of my life or understanding it was imposter syndrome. Being out there on my own meant that I had to do a lot of acting. I had to do a lot of pretending, and dare I say it, lying to the authorities, to the schools about what I was doing, who I was doing it with and how. School holidays, um, getting school reports completed, doing homework, I didn't do truism because it would be easy to be caught out. I didn't get it ill because it'd be easy to be caught out. It was important for me to stay strong and be strong. I didn't know that now, then, sorry, but I know that now. That being strong, being resilient, being confident, being there 24-7, regardless of what you felt or was or were doing, was important for the system and the authorities not to catch you out. And with rejection came an ability to create acceptance. So I did everything and anything that made me look that everything was okay, Jack. So as I said, uh, my parents were me up pretty strictly. So clothes were really important for me. Uh, my, my, my parents were into clothing, were into style. And one of the things that really held out for me was being the, the ability to sort of say, right, every day I go to school, everywhere I go, be it church, be it school, be it a person's party, I looked the part. That was in order to gain acceptance. And also there's other parts of acceptance as well. Living on the streets of South London, there was a big gang culture. You had to play the part. Although I went to, I went to a pretty good school of grammar, walking back home or being with my friends or being with those particular people meant that you had to be accepting and accepted. And so therefore came across in particular ways, in particular circumstances to be accepted in the gangs of the 70s and 60s and other parts growing up as well which played a part in how I've become today was how and who I did things with who I looked up to who I didn't look up to who were my role models for examples how and why they became my role models examples and all these play their part in creating and building my resilience and and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail to what what that meant for me as an individual being more resilient. So what was it like to be home alone? 
it really didn't start to make sense until 2003 when my father died um, and I went through heavy doubt depressions and started to see counselling and started to understand and break apart what it was like to go to school at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 on your own. Don't get me wrong, I did see my family, Christmas, Easter, summer holidays, flew back to Nigeria, flew back to London. But you know, you're getting up at what, eight o'clock, 8.15, getting into school for 8.45, preparing yourself, cornflakes was my dairy girl, um, then onto the school bus, then up to, to, to meet my mates. As we grew up, they started to understand that he's a bit different, she's a bit different, how come, why? We created our own packs. We created our own little understanding. Um, what do you call it? Not sign language as such, but language which was our own language that made us stronger, made us um, compact, and as I said, made us more acceptable. Because school was tough. I mean, I, I lived in Brixton. I went to school in Battersea. It was a grammar school, predominantly uh, white male Catholic school. And then again, it was about how you should show resistance. Why did I? Why was I Catholic? Well, my dad was a Muslim. He became a Catholic because as far as he could see it, that was another way of being accepted within society. And society at that time was difficult. A lot has changed, but not that much. But the difficulties I ex experienced was first and foremost being black, first and foremost, obviously living on my own, obviously having to pretend and be different in certain circumstances with certainly different individuals. And so being at school was very, very difficult but equally it was made easier because you could always find out who, was, who else was home alone or who else had different living standards or, or, or different ways of living. And that in itself created camaraderie, that in itself built confidence, and that in itself, I would suggest, created more resilience. The resilience to do with situations that maybe other people couldn't. And with that came family and friends. As I said, I wasn't the only one home alone. I mean, the radius of about a mile of where I lived there are many um, people who were either living on their own or were being left on their own for long periods of time, and we would congregate. And one of the mainstays of that community was having community spaces, be it church, be it centres, be it after school clubs, where we would congregate, where we would talk and discuss how and what it was we were doing to survive. And we were surviving, don't get me wrong, it wasn't... Um, Poverty for me, my, my mother and father had done well, they bought a home, they bought a couple of properties, and I was living off the rent from people paying my mother and um, father, but it was still difficult to make decisions. It was still difficult to understand what would be deemed acceptable by authorities or societies, um, and that was mainstay. So when we used to go to the markets to do our shopping, we'd probably congregate outside Brixton Market, meet the, our regular butchers, meet our regular friends. But again, it was about building resilience and understanding how that would work. And that was really part throughout my um, educational years, be it um, from secondary school. And when my parents, or my mother, shall I say, returned with my two sisters in 1988, 89, again, it was a different lifestyle. The summer of love, remembering that, how and what it was to say to my mum at that time, these are decisions I'm making. I'm going to go off now and study and further myself educationally. That also brought itself into when I came 16, 17, and I decided that living with family wasn't for me. I had lived on my own independently for so long. The morals of explaining to my mother where I was going, how I was doing this, what I was doing, were very difficult, very challenging for her and very challenging for me and my siblings also. So I left home at about 17 uh, and, and found myself digs in North London, which meant employment, which meant, again, another realm of building resilience, building relationships, becoming accepted or being unaccepted and then dealing with that. So your casual labour, my time worked at Marks and Spencer's, my time worked in, in housing and then going off to further education it was all part and parcel of me getting on in the world as far as I could see it. And don't get me wrong, there were some really bad times. I mean, the free riots that happened in, in Brixton at the time, the attitude to young men by the police at the time, um, the behaviours of certain individuals just walking on the street. I'm a football addict. I was an Arsenal supporter. I was involved in those shenanigans, as they were saying, as you would say. But they also built character. They also built resilience. That was the negative stuff. But the good stuff in terms of doing well at school, being perceived as being a, an, honest, uh, an honest John, an honest boy, again, helped with the confidence, which in itself, I, I would argue, helped with building my resilience. 
So what do you are you saying to yourself? Is all that got to do with running a business? Well, one of the things that happened with me, um, as you probably imagine, although strictly um, brought up, adhere to most of those um, vision values that my father had. I did some things that weren't savory. I did I got involved with some people that were unsavory. And so some of my choices weren't great, but what I did have was a dream and a vision to do well, whatever that meant. And although my father and my mother at the time wanted me to be a doctor, I didn't like blood, but I had to do the A-levels. And this is where the, the, the next part of my story is really what started to build the resilience within me to not give up, never give up. Keep on going, keep on pushing. You do your O levels, great. You get nine, you get 10. You do your A levels, you fail. You're, you're castigated by your parents, you're shunned by some family, but you crack on. You say, I'll do another set of A levels because actually, Dad, I do want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer. You do your degree, you go to law school, you go to interviews, you're shunned. You're not, your deemed not good enough. You're deemed not acceptable within that clique. Fine, move on worked for Hammersmith and Fall um, Law Centre for a few years, then find myself working in housing, worked in housing for over 30 odd years, um, started as an assistant, left as assistant director of housing, all good stuff. You think you're going to get on further, but you don't. There are redundancies, there are restructures, there are confidentiality agreements, there's um, um, disciplinary issues. You move on, you crack on, you work, you survive, you build up on these things, you move forward. Because what I always dreamt of is just doing well. Because when I was younger, I grew up and seen people who hadn't done well. When I was younger, I'd seen people who, although they were honest Johns and did everything they did well, they didn't live well. And my dream was to do well. Didn't really understand what that was other than having a family and being okay, Jack, not being sent to prison, not being done for this, not being done for that. And that was my dream. That was my reality. My shape as well. How would I move my life forward? What are the tool, what's the toolkit I have to do that? How would I put my dreams into action, turn them into reality? And what would be my here and now? And my here and now really has been based on that journey. That journey of taking a positive perspective on different situations, viewing all challenges as learning opportunities. And boy, did I go through some challenges regulating my emotions and experiencing feelings of good, bad, and indifferent. Today, we call it well-being. In those times, it was just deal with it, you know? Come home on a Friday night, have a bit of food, sitting on my Jack Jones watching TV and wondering what's my sister's up to, what my, what's my mum and dad up to, but just getting over it because the next day, I had football to look forward to or a birthday party to look forward to or, dare I say it, go to watch the Arsenal. And it was also about focusing on things that I could control instead of things that I couldn't control. I learned very early on that the system is often built against you, but what you can do is control what is given to you to control. And that is often your destiny. And so for me, those were aspects of what I considered the, some of the toolkits that helped me move forward. And it was also recognizing what was right and what was wrong very early on and how to implement change and how to seek advice and to shape that. So let's bring it fast forward almost to where I am today and how being resilient in the space and work in, in business is really key to having a successful business. So 2016, 2017, I'm working for a, a large local authority, head of housing services, and I was expected to come to the next step, but that didn't happen. But when you've been asked to sign your third confidentiality agreement, you have to take stock. And I did. Sat down with my partner and said, look, I've been working for 33 odd years, local authorities, housing associations, private sector, and it's just not working. I feel I'm strong. I feel I'm confident. I'm feeling good. But do I need to be resilient in that space forever and ever? The answer is no. Take a choice. Make a choice. Do something different. So I set up my own coaching and mentoring practice. I've probably been coaching probably 15, 20 years before that. But to do it on my own meant that I had to bring together the resources that I had compiled over the previous 40 plus years and go for it. But it wasn't just going for it per se. I had a plan. I had a dream. 
And I felt I had a toolbox to deliver that dream. And so for me, it was about identifying how and who and where would I be a coach or a mentor and how and who and where would be able to support me in that journey. And what would be the essence of that journey in terms of the resilience and the experience that I had had previously in pushing my business forward? Because as we all know, running businesses of various sizes, there are going to be ups and downs. There could be peaks and troughs. There can be obstacles. There are going to be situations which you expect and then don't expect. And I would say, luckily for me, and I'm dare say for many of you too, we've experienced similar situations. And our transferable skill set has enabled us to endure, has enabled us to overcome those things. So my upbringing, my lifestyle, I believe, has really put me in good stead to overcome those things. Is it been nature or has it been nurture? I would argue it's been a combination of the two. Definitely the life startup my parents had envisaged for me from very early on were installed. The environment in which I lived and how I lived made that happen. But the experiences and how I overcome those experiences have also been key for my development and moving forward. So what is it like being a coach and a mentor in uh, 2023? Well, what's it like for running a business for any of us over the last five years? You know, what have we had to endure and how we've had to endure it? Endure it? Because I would argue that building resilience in the workplace is a combination of both nurture and nature. It's what you experience, it's how you experience, and most importantly, how and what you do to learn from that experience and bring that to your kill toolkit and knowledge. Without a shadow of a doubt, some people are born in certain ways, certain traits that make them more resilient than others, arguably. Optimism, adaptability, bounce back ability. If you're a football person like me, you have Arsene Wenger and, Ver and, and Alex Ferguson always talking about bounce back ability, always talking about this is brought you down, what's going to bring you up? How is it going to bring you up? What's your support mechanisms? Although I was living on my own, um, or my, should I say my parents were not with me, my siblings, my immediate siblings weren't with me, I was never on my own. There was a number of home learners. I was living in a house of young students who looked on and said to me at various times, do that, don't do that, what's happening here, what's happening there. The communities that I lived in, but the school that I was, was very instrumental in making me understand how what it was that could make me the person I am today. Because what I would argue is that resilience can be learned and developed through various practices and techniques. The main, or should I say, the well-being aspects of the techniques that I probably used growing up was to, to be physically fit, to be aware that actually the way I looked and came across was important in terms of being acceptable, not being picked on, not being pulled up by SPG left, right and centre, or not being, as it were, looked on um, unfavourably in school. And you develop these practices and techniques because you pick them up from other people and you look and learn. One of the great things that my, my father left with me is to be well read and, and reading and understanding how and what could help me move forward as it was, was great things as well. The nurture factors are that contributed to my upbringing, um, resilience in the work, particularly moving forward and running my business is about having that supportive work environment. So when I went into the business, I, I took from me from my, my 30 odd years in working in social housing is the ability to network. One's net worth is one's net work. One's net work is one net worth. And so in order to stand, not stand alone, you need to build a tribe around you. FSB is one of my tribes. of network and organizations is one of my tribes. My clients, potential clients, my collaborators, my partners, they're all my tribe. They're all my network that create that supportive environment for me to overcome the bad things, to come become the worst things. But most importantly, and equally, is to celebrate the successes that we, we, we share moving forward. I'd also like to add is opportunities. Failing your A-levels, failing your O-levels, failing this, not getting that contract, not being successful there, getting a bad review on this or, or Google review or, or, or a negative feedback or a negative experience are all part and parcel, I would argue, about building that resilience, creating that confidence to do better, to do different. I love music. That was another important part of growing up, listening to music, being a mayor of music, how it can support you, drive you forward. And one of my favourite bands is R.E.M. And I, and I nicked that moniker for one of my um, 
coaching mantras, review, evaluate, and monitor, review, evaluate, and monitor. Do that constantly. Have to probably done it throughout my life. Why have I done this? How have I done this? What's been the benefit of it? How are you going to monitor it? How's it going to move forward? Probably didn't think about it in such strategic terms as a 15-year-old or 14-year-old, but golly gosh, must have thought myself, if I come home at 11.30 at night and there's no one to open the front door, will that happen again over the weekend? Probably not. So you have to understand what's going to be the benefits of me of doing certain things one way and certain things another way. So the opportunities for growth and development are constant in your running of your business. But sometimes those opportunities don't arise until you push yourself, until you challenge yourself. And one of the main things that you do when you're living on your own or you're growing up on your own or you're having to do certain things on your own, even with your immediate support, is you ask questions. If you don't ask, you don't get. And that's probably why I became a coach, because I love asking a question. I love asking a difficult question to be checked and challenged, because I was checked and challenged throughout my life. Um, I wouldn't say it's been a hardish life, but it had, definitely hasn't been rosy. But what has helped me is the ability to ask questions, to ask questions to get out of situations, and most importantly, to ask questions to get into situations. Because I think that by asking those questions enables you to create those opportunities for growth and then also to contribute to building um, that resilience that you have in a business and or in a workplace. So in order to ask questions, you have to be a pretty effective communicator. And um, yeah, communication has been key. The amount of times I used to be stopped and searched or pulled up by the teacher or pulled up by X, Y, and Z, you had to have the gift of the gab to get out of that. And that gift of the gab does happen, I reckon, by having experienced certain situations, certain circumstances that mean, wow, that's one way of getting out. I'm well read. I love a TV, I had to watch TV 24 seven. I was on my jacks most of the time, but watching that, reading that, learning that has enabled me, I think, apparently, so it's been said, to communicate well. And that communication is important if you want to be able to get through a situation. Um, effective communication and feedback are essential for building workplace resilience, I would argue. You're in a situation, you're, you're having a one-to-one, -one, you're given a one-to-one, -one, you're holding a disciplinary process, you're part of a disciplinary process, you're trying to build a, a team, you're trying to affect a team, you're trying to manage a team, trying to lead a team, you need to be effectively uh, an effective communicator. And that's one of the, I think, positive traits that I learned um, growing up, be it at school, be it in my first jobs, and definitely being in a workplace um, as a housing board, and most recently as a, um, owner of a business and that kind of not culminates but sort of moves to building that positive culture that culture that celebrates success and achievements and again in that self fosters resilience um, I'm an Arsenal supporter so you could have told by went last on Wednesday it wasn't a good time for us we lost we got battered we got we got we got dealt with so what what are you going to learn from that is what's important as business owners, what are you going to learn from your disappointments? As business owners, how are you going to motivate that team to look up and say, that's what we're going for, that's our goals. These are but incremental steps towards that goals. As every single one of us has had incremental steps across our lives about the journeys that we're on. Um, I do a lot of mentoring of young people. And one of the things I try to share with them is that your idea or your dream can only be got if you take the right steps or take action to those steps. But building a positivity around you and a positivity with the people that you work with, your team, your collaborators, will help um, in terms of success. But celebrating that success or achievement will help with, with your resilience. Um, anyone who has done mental health awareness work or well-being work knows that we all live with a vat of ups and downs. And if you're not celebrating those successes, and you're going for a bit of a bad, bad patch, what are you going to lean on? And for me, it's my vat of successes. Um, when I say um, housing board, any email, any positive feedback that I got, I'd send it off to myself, my own little outbox, and it would say achievements. And when I was going for a downer, I'll just open that up and say, wow, that's what that person said to me in 1999 or 2001 or 2003. Same way I did growing up as a young person. All my school reports, I signed them off myself because my parents weren't here. The question you're going to ask is who came in to do the school thing? 
anyone who I could muster from my household or an uncle aunt would come in, but I'd sign it up. But I have every single school report that I can remember. I used to also have all the rejection letters from the lawyers that I, I tried to apply for in the early, uh, late 80s and, and early 90s. But what I'm saying is celebrating those successes and keeping them has helped me also build that resilience. It's helped me build that fortitude that my dream can and will be successful if I remember what was the good things that I'd done. Almost come to an end uh, where we're going to be able to take some, uh, some questions. Um, so natural resilience traits obviously exist, I think, uh, but they can still build resilience through deliberate practice and effective coping strategies. And I hope I've tried to share some of those that have come from me as a result of how I lived and also a result of the partnerships that I've created. But throughout that journey, I think the most important aspect for the resilience that I've built up and continue to build up is developing a growth mindset and focusing on learning and development and focusing on celebrating on successes. So there are a number of tools that are out there that we can use, mindfulness, meditation, definitely nutrition, physicality, but I would say building on your successes and celebrate, celebrating your successes. So I'm happy to share with you some examples of resilience and through the questions and answers. I hope that has been food for thought for you. Amazing, Bayo. It's one of those, considering how long I've known you for, hearing, I suppose, the stories when you were a child, it, it, it's mad, it's mad, but it, you're a testament to your own resilience at the minute. So um, if anybody's got any questions, you've got a Q&A box at the bottom, please feel free to put them in and I will certainly ask Bayo as they come through, but I'll kick them off. I've got the first one. Is there one defining moment throughout your childhood, adolescence, even your career that you think has made you more resilient today? Yes. Um, I was a budding senior manager in a local authority um, and a, a new individual came on board as the executive director and we didn't get on well and he made it clear in the interview after interview workshop after workshop while he was there I would not get to that next level he was there for two or three years I didn't get to that next level the moment he left and someone else came in and I applied for a certain role that I'd been applying for two or three years previously I was successful and it just said to me if you really want it and you believe in yourself and getting it, don't give up the ghost. Um, and that was a turning moment for me because I could have just sat there and just said, all right, that's my lot, leave it. But even while he was there, I kept on applying, I kept on applying, I kept on getting knocked on the head. And the murmur around me was, how, why, how, why, babe, you must give this up, go, leave. But I said, no, this is where I am and this is what I want to do. So, yeah. Brilliant. I've already got a couple of questions. So I've got one from Tanya. Um, she says, what are your thoughts about working in and with nature to help build resilience? If the circumstances arise, definitely. Um, and what I want to understand is in, in, in nature, what, what that means is for me, you know, I brought up in concrete London. So for me, getting out and about is important. I, I do lots of walks. For me, nature is more about physicality, getting out on my bike and experiencing freedom as I see it. Um, I, I, because of the way and where I lived, I haven't been exposed to that much natural nature per se. Having three young boys is, is changing that, but I would agree with you, Tanner, that that would be a way forward, definitely. But there's different ways for different people to experience or, or build on their resilience, as, as I've tried to share. Brilliant. Julie asks, do you share your most difficult moments with your clients? Um, as a coach, if I'm asked, yes. So the answer is yes. If I'm asked, yes. Um, in workshops, um, being vulnerable is key to moving forward. If you're not able to self-reflect, if you don't have any emotional intelligence, then you're going to be finding it very hard to be empathetic and understanding with your client base. And that's important if you want to build that trust and respect to get them where to where they want to get to and believe in what you're doing. So the answer to that is a definite yes. Yeah. Are there any stories that you wouldn't share with them? 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so sure as I, I won't been. put you on the spot. I won't make him tell us um, all now. But there, there's, there's ways of telling a story about certain incidences. It's dependent on the client, what they want to do and how they want to share. Um, yeah, it's important to be honest and open and vulnerable. So the stories can be shared or at least anecdotes to impart understanding can be shared with a client. I take, to, to take it more to sort of like a team effort. I've got a question from Paul here. He says, how important is this? Um, how important is it to have a positive team around you? It is highly important. The most successful businesses, workplaces, situations are around having that team. The difficulty is how do you build that team? So the, 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 yeah, once you have a team that knows where it's going, how it's doing, how it's been supported, how it's being led to be the best it can be in that moment, what's its goals and objectives, that will help you fly. The situation for any team leader or any builder of a team is how and what you need to do to incorporate that. And, and those are the stepping stones that are imparted through resilience, but equally about how you shape that team is important. And, and for that, you need to be open, you need to be honest, you need to be transparent, but equally, you need to show that leadership by setting those goals and, and, and being open and honest about how and who is involved in achieving those goals. And for me then, after all the above, celebrate success. Obviously you address the, the, the negatives or the downsides part of it, but once you've hit those little KPIs, big or small, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Julie's just put a, a question in and it's exactly what I was actually gonna ask you here because I know I've been in this situation. Um, how do you deal with a negative person in the team or a disruptive person who uses intimidation towards others? So as a coach, I would flip that question for you and ask you, how would you answer it? But let's break that down. How do you deal with, um, you, you, you need to call them out. You're in, a, you're in a situation where you have some standards, you have some um, expectations, you have some objectives. So you need to call them out. You would have read recently with what's going on around bullying and how bullying is termed or not termed. You need to be upfront and forthright in what you believe. And you need to have shared that consistently through your team from the time that person joined to the time that you're pulling them out. I would argue that if that person hadn't wasn't onboarded successfully in the right way and you hadn't seen telltale signs of that disruptive element of them, then your onboarding process needs to be looked at. Anyway, you're out where you are, you pull them up, you take them aside and you talk to them about how and why, what they're doing is not acceptable. And depending on your policies and procedures and who you are and what type of business you run, you give them one, the opportunity to improve and change with support, or two, the opportunity to improve and change with support and a timeline, or three, depending on what behavior it was, you usher them out the door. But that should be contained in the whole essence and philosophy. Oh, you seem to have frozen just for just for this little moment. There we go. Needs to move on. Sorry about that. Yeah. Brilliant. No, that's fine. And it, it is fun. I know when I was employed all these years ago, I I was a top seller in an organization. And I suppose because I was deemed to be quite bubbly, which I think some people will probably say is a bit debatable at times, but um, I was put with one of the negative people on the team to hopefully improve their performance and bring them out of their shell, etc. But it actually had the total reverse. I went from being a top seller to on performance review. So I both, all of those things are actually also about asking the team what you can do for them as well. Definitely, definitely yeah. that. Um, yeah, it's people will follow good people there's an odd there's an always an odd individual bad apple you might use that expression but they can be changed too it's just a question of how and what you've done to engage them and how you've engaged them um and and whether they have a belief in what you're trying to do as well and so going back to the question about the team it's a team effort if they can pull out an individual and support them and pull them up that will work too yeah. Um, Denise has made a comment and followed it with a question. So one of the key factors in developing resilience is to see the positive elements in each experience. Um, how do you remain positive when it appears that the odds are against you? Uh, everyone has a dream. Martin Luther King talked about a dream. 
What's that goal? What's that ambition? What's that drive that you have? Where do you want to go? And my my look at positive elements is they're, they're, they're things to, to celebrate. When you're on a downer, you just celebrate what's been good. Create that positivity, create that um, positivity within you and take it to that workplace, particularly when the odds are against you because the odds are against you for a moment in time. And if you've got the will for all, the skill set, the toolbox to overcome those odds, you will do. It might not be immediately. It might not be as you would like it, but you will do. And once you've done that, celebrate it and then learn from that experience so that when the odds are against you again, you have a toolbox which is better placed to overcome those odds probably more quickly and most definitely toward the way you would like it to be. Brilliant. Should we talk of a little bit more mindfulness? So how do you think mindfulness can help you manage stress and self-awareness and potentially even resilience as well? Yes. Um, I'm going to bring it down closer to, to the person that, if you understand what you're about, what makes you tick, then you again show empathy to others. And how you do that is by others asking questions, understanding what's going on around you, understand your own emotional intelligence, and then working out what will create that positive space for you and in that time. You could be, you can meditate, you could do um, things physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, which are good for you. But I still think to bring that together, the catalyst is to understand who you are and why and what makes you tick and then drive forward to bring others on board. That's how I, that's how I treat my So when I'm meditating, it's about what is it that I'm trying to clarify? What is it that I'm trying to clear up? Or well, what is it that I'm trying to bring to myself in that moment, in that space? An objective. Your mindfulness is based on what objectives you have, what goals you've set, what resources you have to achieve those goals, and then for the options to move forward. Do, do you think, um, and I know we've had this conversation before in one of our deep and meaningful set in the world to rights. Um, do you think if you've got a negative mindset, that you will attract negativity? Do you think just by having a positive mindset, you can actually influence the outcome of? Yes, and I didn't ever used to believe that. Um, I grew up being a positive pessimist. I always looked for the dark side of this situation. And then when it didn't happen, we But no, you... you, you Positive attract. You, you, yeah, you got to think as positive. You, you, you're naturally going to think about Danny. It's, it's not good. I'm on my own. It's not working. But if you spin that and look at what is it you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it, where has it been done before? How can it be done before? If you're that driven and you're up for it, and you start thinking of all the positive done things that you've done before, I go to my Outlook email. I go to my my shoe boxes of of rejections, my shoeboxes of positivity. I look at my sons, I look at my partner, I look at my life and say, yeah, it's going to come. It's going to come. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take a, probably a, a change in direction, a, a tweaking of the plan, tweaking of circumstances, but it will come, particularly if you've done good and great things before, because that is what is going to propel you moving forward. So yes, positivity works. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned earlier that you love to read. I'm really bad at reading. I start a book, I put it down. But if you had to recommend mm. the Thank best you. book you could um, in regard to today's um, subject, what would it be? Can you oh, remember? Actually, yeah. Because I am, I am a great reader, but I am not a great rememberer of titles. Um. Well, you just stopped, you just mentioned mindset, didn't you? So let's talk about mindset. There's a book by a Carol Dwork. It's called um, Positive Mindset. Um, that's the book. Let me get the proper title for us here. But there is a book about mindset. There's one, there's there's three books we can mention, but I forget their titles, but it's they're all around mindset. How do you create that positive mindset? How do you build on what you have to push forward? 
Uh, so I need to find a title, I'm, or otherwise I'm waffling. Think of another question when I find a title, please. I can think of, I've thought of one already. So mm. um, you also mentioned about imposter syndrome, mm. and I'm sure probably many of us that are here today have it. I mean, even for myself, just being the host on here today mm-hmm. filled me with dread. But I always think, just scare yourself every day and eventually you'll, you'll get over it. So that's what I do. But do you still face imposter syndrome? And if so, yeah. how have you overcome it? Yeah. Um, when I became a coach, I, I, here's a little, little anecdote. Well, I became a coach um, after 33 years working in social housing. I've been using LinkedIn for 17 years prior, prior to setting up my business. I did not change my profile on LinkedIn for two years because I just didn't feel I was ready to tell the world that I am who I am. But it goes back to that question of mindset. It goes back to that question of positive elements. It goes to that question of building resilience itself and, and creating a positive team. Think of all the good things that you've done in the past and what you want to do in the future, and then think about how you're going to go for it. That can and should help you overcome um, the positive, that, that, that negative space. It's not forever because you're just going to have that negative space from time to time, but there's a well of positivity within that can overcome that and propel you to move forward. Got another question for you, actually. So Bethany's asked, how do you go about rebuilding resilience after events have depleted it? Well, those events that have depleted seems final, but so I'm not going to accept it's final, are there for you to learn and build on in order to replenish your levels of resilience, just using your terminology. I think depletion is a finite thing and nothing is finite what is happening is at that moment you're feeling down and out but actually if you sit back and reflect take a bit of self-awareness and look at what happened and then work out right next time this is what i'm going to do this is how i'm going to do it then your levels will be what whatever the opposite word of depletion increased <laughs> i talk about um, a well a vat of good stuff the more good stuff you put in the better it is when the bad stuff happens. Yes. Chopping it up, definitely. Brilliant. Have you thought of those books? <laughs> Not letting you off. <laughs> I, know, I know. I'm looking for the titles. Good God. I'll just go and go. I suppose okay. it, it's a prime, it, prime reason for people to follow you on LinkedIn if they're not all doing it already. And you can you can put them on there if we can't think of them. Yeah, Although I'll, somebody I'll, has well, actually... Here we, are. here we are, here we are. So we have... Uh, Milton Mil- uh, mindset changing the way you think to fulfill your potential. That's the title. That's the book I have on my shelf, and it's by Dr. Car- Carol S. Dweck. I can never pronounce her surname. D W E C K. Yes, and, and actually, D W E C K. Yes, there you go. A few people are beating me to it. Well done. <laughs> yes, so there's ten videos as well out there for you. So, yeah. um, thank you very much. Brilliant. Let me just make sure that there's no other questions in this because Rebecca's um, point here actually comes on to something else that I'm going to say. So let me just bear with me whilst I read. I can't read and talk. So, one final question What's your thoughts on resilience and knowing when to call it quits? That comes from Amy. I, I, it goes back to what your goals and objectives are. If you remember the story I told about the, 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 my manager who said I was never going to become him or a senior position, that was my dream. That was my goal. And I stood by myself and done. I did it. As part of my stories as well, there comes a time when they, you're not going to do what you want to do in that space, but you have enough transferable skills, experience, and knowledge to do it in another space. My dad wanted to be a doctor, never became a doctor. I wanted to be a lawyer, never became a lawyer. I worked in social housing for 33 years, think I was going to be a CEO. That didn't happen. Now I have my own coaching and mentoring practice. I have dreams and goals there. That ain't them. That will happen for so long, but there's something else that might happen. And each time I have gone and adapted and taken the positive elements about myself and put on what I'm good at and what I'm better at and did it. And actually... I'm getting better at what I do and coming probably closer to whatever it is that I should have been doing way back then. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I, did you actually give us the name? Otherwise, I know Julie Deepak's mentioned in here about Carol, and I'm going to say Dweck as well. That's it's how Carol I say Dweck. it. But it, it, there is actually a 10 minute TED video that she nicely explains the examples, and she has many books on the topic. In um, there's also the Matthew Saeed, former British table tennis player about mindset so if you haven't read that one Bayo, there's, there's an example for you as well um and Rebecca's also mentioned about a book um that's called dealing with stress the mind body spirit way and I know that one's available on Amazon and I think that's actually from Rebecca Rebecca wrote that one um does anybody have any further questions and is there anything that you want to summarize your bit um Bayo, otherwise I will just make or have a quick mention about FSB care. Yeah. Um yes, so for me, let, let me share this with you then, guys. Uh, this is something I do share with, with my, my clients from time to time, um, depending on what, what there are. I always finish off or this I'm gonna finish off with science, learn from the past in order to plan for the future live in the present in order to control the controllable and forever celebrate success. So I read that again, Leon, learn from the past to plan for the future, live in the present to control the controllable and forever celebrate success. Brilliant, it's amazing. So anybody here, obviously, if you are struggling with, I suppose sometimes the pressures that being a business owner can put on onto your or as business owners we put onto ourselves more often than not um fsb members actually have access to a, an amazing benefit called fsb care which some of you may have already used may be aware of as well um, but it's actually there to support you with personal stuff at the end of the day rather than the business side of things so if you have a new or existing pre-existing medical condition, but it also covers mental health, which covers stress, anxiety, et cetera. And I know Rebecca mentioned about the book that she's got on Amazon. She's actually somebody that you can access via FSB care as well. Um, but it is there to support you with your businesses, because as business owners, we forget to look after ourselves. Um, and it is one of the amazing benefits that gets you back to where you should be and help you to run your business by looking after our minds, but also our bodies as well. Um, I think we've, we've sort of touched on the workplace, although we didn't go into it in too much detail. But if any of you do actually have employees, also remember as FSB members, you have access to employment advice and support via the legal helpline and also on the the legal hub as well so if you're actually struggling and you do have disruptive employees or you've got situations going on remember that you can access support as well through the legal helpline um but i'd like to say a massive thank you bayo um it's amazing to hear sort of your backstory and really the amount of time you spent on your own because i suppose probably lots of us haven't had to go through that we will have all had our own um experiences and some worse than others but it, it it's great to see that actually your experience have turned you into an amazing man um and supporter of others as well because i know a lot of what you do is actually pushing back and helping other other people as well um which it could have by the sounds of it gone a totally different way as well so thank you um but Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned previously, this session has been recorded, so it should be on the FSB website on the on demand section shortly. So please feel free to watch it back um, if there's sort of any areas or you missed any point. Um, if you do or aren't already an FSB member and you think, actually, do you know what? I'd like to know more or I'd love to join. Either contact me directly or go onto the FSB website and you can book a meeting with your local membership advisor as well. And they can obviously explore, understand a bit more about your business and explain to you all the amazing benefits that you would have access to. But thank you everybody for joining us and hopefully we will see you on the next one. Thank you.